We are WNEO Channel 45 Alliance and WEAO Channel 49 Akron. You are supported public television stations serving Northeastern Ohio. This is Ohio Educational Broadcasting. cursor will appear again tonight. I need to study. But that computer break was fun and interesting too. I can't concentrate. Maybe it was just a dream. was no dream, Reggie. Do you really think something like me could be imagined? Well, I do have an active imagination. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Will you talk to me while I check the store? All right. <laughs> it amazes me some of the things they have on display in this store. Oh, they're elementary, my dear Watson, elementary. Actually, Reggie, those displays are some of the items that have played a part in the history of computers. Stones? Certainly. That was a memory aid that cavemen used to count and remember numbers. Oh, I see. Well, what about this? Ah, that's an abacus. An ancient device used in China and other Asian countries to do math problems. An improvement over stones? Mm, things continue to improve. Let me present you with some visual pictures to help you understand the history of computers. Okay. Look at that picture. Mm-hmm, that's the one. In 1642, Pascal developed an adding machine to aid his father in accounting. Humans create to meet their needs. Necessity is the mother of invention. Exactly. One idea that aided the process of automation was Joseph Jacquard's loom in 1804. It used small, stiff cards with holes to control the action of the loom. Cards with holes? Oh, like a player piano. It uses paper with holes to control the action of the keys. Ah, yes. I enjoy the player piano. Mm. The air passes through the holes, creating a vacuum. This causes posts to strike certain keys. And that same principle has been used down through history? Mm, you catch on fast. It's the guide that motivates me. <laughs> that goes without saying. <laughs> Charles Babbage, an Englishman, designed an engine in 1833 that held numbers, performed calculations, and received input from cards with holes in them. <laughs> Sorry to say, the engine was never completed. Sounds like a computer. Mm, computers today are based on many of the principles used in Babbage's analytical engine. Other people picked up on his idea? Oh, yes. In 1890, a young man named Hollerith introduced the idea of punch cards to take the census. <laughs> Those cards with holes sure get around. Mm, many people refer to the cards with holes as Hollerith cards. By using the cards with holes in them and a tabulating machine, Hollerith was able to do in two and a half years what had taken seven years before. Time marches on. Yes, it does. Do you remember the analog digital computer we saw at the hospital? The computer with the laser that reads blood cells? That's it. Oh. An analog computer solves problems by measuring one quantity in terms of some other quantity. Oh. A thermometer is an example. I see. And I suppose a digital uses digits. Yes. A digital computer solves problems by counting digits or numbers. Like me. 
One and one is two. Oh, your mathematical ability never ceases to amaze me, oh. Reggie. The point is, in 1930, the first analog computer was built. And in the early 1940s, two men by the name of Atansasoff and Barry experimented with an electronic computer. From this, in 1946, the first large-scale digital computer, the ENIAC, was built by Mochley and Eckert at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, hold it. An ACK? No, ENIAC. That means Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator. What a name. Mm. The ENIAC contained 18,000 vacuum tubes. 18,000 of these? Mm -hmm. That's a lot. It must have been large. <laughs> it filled a space about the size of a singles tennis court, about 1,500 square feet. What did it weigh? Oh about 30 tons. Consider that one elephant weighs five tons, then it would take... Six. Six elephants to equal 30 tons. <sighs> 30 tons. That's quite a computer. Mm. The ENIAC cost $400,000 to build, and it used 140 kilowatts of power. Glad I didn't have to pay that electrical bill. Mm -hmm. It would take 20 houses all running at maximum to use that much power. But the ENIAC could multiply two numbers in about three milliseconds. Boy, that's faster than I can blink my eyes. Try blinking just one eye. Oh, you better watch that, Reggie. I was just doing like you said. Good. That's what you're supposed to do. You got me that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, now, how did we get from that giant to these micros? Oh, you notice a difference, do you? Well, uh, comparing these microcomputers is like comparing a mouse to an elephant. What happened? A transistors, resistors, and capacitors. You mean these? Yes. Transistors, along with resistors and capacitors, replace the vacuum tube. They perform the same function, yet they are smaller and faster. Amazing. Ah, if that gets you, just take a look at the integrated circuits. Integrated circuits? Are these integrated circuits? Yes, they are. Look closely at that white one. That tiny chip in the center is the heart of the circuit. It's called a silicon chip. Silicon chips contain thousands of transistors, resistors, and capacitors. Oh, is this a picture of what's on the silicon chip? Mm-hmm. That's an enlarged view of that chip. Integrated circuits are built around silicon chips. A chip is produced from a wafer. That's a wafer over there. Vanilla. Oh, Reggie. Vanilla wafers and chocolate chips. Oh, food. Food? How about some food for your mind, Reggie? Would you like to see how a chip is designed and produced? Have I got a choice? I mean, I'd love to. Good. Come along, then. First, engineers design the master circuit. Photographic process, along with computers, reduce the master design to microscopic size. The wafers are then processed to form circuits. Oxidation, diffusion, and ion implantation. Ion implantation. Yes, alter the vertical and horizontal topography to create circuit elements. A masking process allows the transfer of the pattern to the circuit using a light-sensitive, acid-resistant layer called photoresist. Photoresist. Mm -hmm. Chemicals are then used to etch away some of the layers, leaving a permanent pattern on the chip. After thorough testing, diamond cutters separate the circuits, and each chip is packaged in a case. Tiny wires are attached to the chip, and that's called bonding. Truly amazing. I bet something like this costs a lot. Oh, negative. They are less expensive, more powerful, and easier to replace. It's because of these little guys that we have microcomputers, right? That's right. I imagine all this progress has really helped large business. Actually, that's an understatement. Let me show you some things. Let's observe how those Hollywood cards are used with computers. The cards with holes in them? <laughs> yes. First, specific information is stored on the cards using a hole punch machine. Then the cards are fed into a card reader. And finally, the information is transferred to the computer for analyzation. So the cards are a mean of storing data and also a method of entering data into the computer. Oh, Reggie, you catch on so quickly. <laughs> now, let's look at a larger company and how it uses computers. This 
this company could never handle the volume of work it does, nor provide accurate up-to-the-minute service without computers. This laser prints 18,000 lines per minute, or 16,000 pages per hour. An average typist can do about six or seven full pages per hour. Wow, what a difference. Yes. And this is the tape library. One tape stores 168,000 sheets of paper. Imagine the space and file cabinets it would take to store this information. Mm -hmm. There are 12,000 tapes in here. It would take a football field to hold so much. Oh, you're right. And this is the network control room. By using modems, telephone hookups, information can be transmitted and received instantly from the main computer. This allows the company to keep in touch with terminals all across the country. Computers have become an integral part of our lives. Fascinating. Of course. I can't be otherwise. You? Oh, you're something else, all right. But I was actually thinking how far we've come. Oh. Well, what's that expression you use? We've come a long way, baby. We certainly have. From stones to... to cursors. Reggie! Oh, now don't get mad. I was just kidding. Actually, you've been extremely helpful. Well, I realize that I've thrown a lot of information at you all at one time, and... Oh, but it's important to understand history. Oh, yes, definitely. It's through history that we see our mistakes. And our successes. Mm-hmm, true. While the history of computers is still fresh in your mind, why don't you identify some of the major events that have happened for me? What do you mean? Well, I want to see if you can remember the sequence of events and the history of computers. Okay. Are you ready? Ready. In 1642... Hmm... Can you give me a hint? A son's invention to aid his father. Oh, Pascal's adding machine. <laughs> yes. And 1804? 1804, yeah. Uh, Ever do any weaving? Weaving. Loom. Jacquard's loom. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about 1833? 1833. Uh, well, I can think of two. Babbage's analytical engine? Yes, that's the only one we talked about. Oh. <laughs> and 1890 saw the invention of... Of 1890, uh... Remember the cards with holes in them? Cards with holes. Oh, Hollerith cards. Oh, oh, oh. Hollerith tabulating machine. Excellent. And 1946. 1946? Oh, that's easy. The ENIAC, which, by the way, was the first large-scale digital computer. Excellent. And we've come from vacuum tubes to... To transistors, resistors, and capacitor, capacitors. And then we move to... Oh, silicon chips. Yes. Oh, and don't forget integrated circuits. Ah, yes. It was because of integrated circuits that we now have microcomputers. And... Oh, and you... Cassandra Cursor. Mm -hmm. I guess we could say that micros have added a lot to your life, Reggie. Yes, I believe we could say that. You know, I wish I were going to be around in a hundred years to see how far we've come. Well, with the advances being made in medicine, with the aid of computers, you may just be around. Wow. Think of that. <laughs>